Okay, so on to our next speaker. So uh, pleasure to welcome David Schroeder. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Um, yeah, after the great talk from Elizabeth about a lot of CI um, processes, um, my talk will be much simpler. I will just talk about one process about melt ponds. Um, before I start, um, um, I would want to mention um, about the melt pond model development that most of the work was done by the Daniela Flocco um, with support from Adrian Turner and Elizabeth and Danny, of course. And I will also talk a bit about climate simulations in this talk. And um, they were carried out by a PhD student here at the British Antarctic Survey, um, Rachel Diamond, um, some for the last interglacial period by a postdoc at Bath Victoria, and um, also big contributions from Jeff from the uh, Met Office and um, from Luisa and from Bath. Okay, I start in 1998, where was a built field experiment um, in the Arctic, the Sheba experiment. And um, Sheba means the surface heat budget of the Arctic Ocean, um, which were carried out in from May. On lakes and they are so-called melt ponds. And when um, these, these ponds are spreading here on the next photo on 22nd of June and on the 25th of Ju July, so which is in May, the, the key period of a melt pond evolution uh, where the area becomes larger and the ponds become deeper. And um, in this scene here on the 7th of August, another two weeks later, this is also in this case due to the divergent that, will be, um, that the extent of the ponds increases. And then later in August, um, the freeze up starts. So there is an ice lid forming on these melt ponds. And later in this, on the 4th of October, um, you can't, all the ponds are frozen up. So there are no ponds um, visible again. Um, after these measurements, there was a decade in which melt pond models were developed. And um, on um, a paper here from 2004 from Taylor and Feldham, they um, created a one-dimensional um, melt pond model. Um, in this, there is a sea ice, has a mushy layer with a, um, with a solid uh, fraction of, of salt in it. And when there is a, can a melt pond can form on top, there can the ice grow on, uh, ice lit form on the melt pond on snow. And in this one-dimensional model, um, the heat balance equations can be um, calculated at each phases. And here you see a scheme with time. So you have here sea ice and snow on top. And at some point, um, the snow starts to melt. And then you get here, uh, the, the, um, the snow is gone then, and you have here a melt pond. And when the sea ice um, decreases, and then the pond becomes thicker. And at some point, um, where the, the freezing starts, uh, lit can form on the pond. And there can also be some snow on the pond. This has an impact on ice. It's just a one dimensional model. Um, the next step was then to, to, to have a model of horizontal melt pond um, evolution. And this is work from 2006 and published 2010. And then we had a lot of these, these one dimensional columns and this kind of was a quite high resolution the five meter columns um, where you have each column, they have ice and some of them you have snow and then you can have uh, uh, the pond form. So if you look a bit in reality here, with the schematic so that the ponds collects a bit due to in a way with gravity on the local on the lowest point of the sea ice top topography. And, and this model is um, the sea level is calculated and assuming that the entire flow is in a hydrostatic equilibrium and then there is drainage due to um, using um, Darcy's law and we have here the horizontal transport depending on the horizontal permeability the, the, 
the, the, the um, topography. And when you have vertical drainage and the vertical permeability is here a function of a solid, um, solid fraction. And then at the next step, um, the aim is to put this kind of model into a, to a climate model. And there is one important thing in the climate model, you don't have, uh, you don't have a CI topography. But what we do have in, a, in, in climate models, uh, the climate models at this stage, this is a, here was from a paper from 2007 from um, Daniela Flocko and Danny Feldham, an ice thickness distribution. So that each ice, in each ice grid cell, we don't have a homogeneous ice, um, homogeneous ice thickness in this grid cell. We have five, no, we have a, in, in theory, lots of different eye thicknesses and we describe this in the distribution. So we have due on this eye thickness distribution is possible to transfer in a height and depth distribution with the assuming a reference height. Sorry, this was too quick. And um, when we can apply this principle that the, the in reality, the pond water or runs to the in a way to the nearest by lowest location. And we refer this in the model where it, even the grid size is much bigger, but on a larger scale, where it runs from the thicker ice to the thinner ice. Okay, this was happening. It took about yeah, 12 years in a way from the observations of melt ponds from, from the Sheba experiment to coming to this state. And then the, the following decade, when this model was actually implemented into a global climate model. And um, there are from, from um, two papers from um, Daniela as first offer. And in this implementation, the principles are that the meltwater collects on the ice of the lowest height. We have a hydrostatic balance maintained throughout. And when the vertical drainage is calculated from Dar uh, Darcy's law, as it was done in the one dimensional model. And when a very important part is the meltwater is transported as a tracer on each, each ice thickness class, which sounds very, this sounds very trivial, but this was actually quite a hard work. This was um, done by Elizabeth Funke to implement this correctly. And this was, there, was, there were first come difficulties how to do this and to get this balanced. And this was um, quite a tough point um, to do this. But, uh, finally, this works very nicely. And um, meltwater is lost um, during ridging, and it is lost if area decreases due to melting, and when boundary freezing a lid can, uh, can form, this can also melt again, so we have a full process. Um, requirements for being this, we need the ice thickness distribution in the model. And in this implementation in the uh, size model, um, this is based on the data Eddington radiation scheme. Um, where albedos um, values for uh, bare ice, snow ice, and ponded ice are calculated from inherent optical properties like extinction coefficients, scattering albedo, asymm asymmetric properties. And um, when what is important, the melt ponds in this scheme do only affect the albedo. So this is not a full layer in this model, it is just impacts uh, the vertical thermodynamics. By, uh, with the albedo. And um, by doing so, um, we could run some simulations. And these are here um, results from the standalone um, size simulation. And we can see here the annual cycle of the total fraction in the Arctic, which is covered by, 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 by melt ponds, the total fraction of sea ice, which is covered by melt ponds. And we see the melt ponds form in May. And when the maximum is in July, with the gray zone shows all the variability between 1979 and 2013. And when this is the total pond fraction, and here in thick line and with the uh, orange color, it is the male pond fraction, which is covered by lit. So at the beginning of August, lit forms, and by September, all the male ponds are covered by lit. They still exist a bit before they are all nearly all vanished later in the season. And we can see here a nice change in time so that we had in the in the 80s, a lower red point fractions than in the periods after 2000. And here is the, from the simulation two results. Um, this shows the difference between 1996, which was the, in the last 40 years, the, uh, in a way, the year with a, with a coldest spring um, and with the highest summer sea ice extent, 
So we get a very low meltpoint fraction in, the, in July with values more around uh, maximum values around 20 centimeters. And in 2012, where we had a very, very warm spring and still below the ice extent so far, um, we had fractions here over 40. Uh, 40%. Well, these are all model results. Um, it is very difficult so far um, to actually evaluate this. There are some observational data, modus and merits from the past to actually get meltpoint fraction from satellite data, but the reliability is still quite quite critical. I'm hopefully to get some better results from meltpoints from the latest mosaic experience, but I haven't seen these results yet. It was better to validate the actual meltpoint fractions from the model. But they seem to do something which makes seems to be very reasonable. Um, if you look at the impact, and these are here um, simulations, four different simulations. We sh we be, I show here the climatology um, for, the, for the ice extent, the annual cycle, and for the um, ice volume. And the four simulations are, one is with a meltpoint scheme, and two others are what was done before. And this is um, just the, an albedo adjustment um, for melt points and lava is a rel relatively simple semi empirical scheme. And one scheme is we don't account for melt points at all. So if we see if we don't count melt points for all, the ice volume is, is much higher. So we see this shows that the impact of putting in a melt point scheme does actually reduce the ice volume in summer by about 40 percent. However, if we just use the simple scheme, which has been derived also from the Sheba experiments, how is the albedo like? And when we reduce the albedo of sea ice at melting conditions, we can actually get quite similar results. So where's the questions? If you think just about from a climate model point of view, we want the pan-Arctic conditions, do we actually need this complicated meltpoint scheme? Or with the Sheba experiment, which adjusted albedo scheme might be might also be suitable for the, for if we are just using on the global stuff. But we get interesting features from the meltpoint model and want to show some other, other aspects. This was already the indication. If we have a low meltpoint fraction in May, June, July, when um, this is correlated with a, with a, um, with a summer sea ice extent, which is much higher. And if you have a high meltpoint fraction, this is much lower. And actually, even from the detrend, the time series, the meltpoint fraction in May, which is still quite low at the beginning of the season, is the, the detrend time series is strongly correlated. The modeled meltpoint fraction is strongly correlated with the observed sea ice extent. And that's what we could use to do to make some actually some 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 predictions um, three four months. And we have done this since this is a paper from 2013. We have done it till, till now. And actually, our prediction based on the May point data. It has been actually pretty good. We have pretty good skill for the following 12 years by predicting the sea ice extent in September. We observed the ice extent from the Melbourne model. Even though this model setup is not very realistic, there are lots of issues, and the model sea ice extent is not so good. But this indicates that there is probably some tool what we get in the Melbourne model that is important for the melting season. It is so good because of, I think, of two reasons. It's, there is the positive feedback mechanism. It starts with a melt point. So if we get what is happening at the beginning of a melt season is important and we capture something of the preconditioning of the sea ice. But yeah. Okay. Um, now we want to the Hadley uh, Center model decided to run a uh, their new climate simulation for CMX6 with the uh, with the explicit melt point model. And um, but there had to be some time adjustment has to be done because um, uh, the surface balance is calculated in joules, and um, so we don't have a data adding scheme where uh, they used a simple albedo scheme, so which is actually this shows also with uh, the previous CC, CCSM3 albedo scheme, where um, we can see here on before the, the changes that there's first no, there is, a, there is a physical reason why you adjust the albedo when it becomes to melting conditions for ice, which is mainly done to indirectly account for melt points. And if we turn this off and just um, have a constant albedo for snow and then include um, a melt point albedo um, of 0.27 for the visible range. And a bit of, depending on the point depth, um, we use the ice albedo and then the linear gradient and the point albedo for 20 centimeters. Um, in parallel, there has been developed a slightly different melt point scheme. A lot of stuff with the transport and so is, is identical. It's the level ice melt point scheme. But in this scheme, um, there's one big difference. It is not using the ice thickness distribution um, 
for the formation of the meltpoints, but it uses mainly the, the tracer for the level ice, so but the, the fraction of level ice where the meltpoints form in contrast to the to, uh, to the rich ice. And this has made it into the CSM um, model. But okay, I'm focusing here on the on the topographic meltpoint scheme and the the um, uh, Hatcham pre simulations. Okay, so finally we have simulations in the global climate model um, with the meltpoint model included, and we can look at the results. Um, in the last years. Um, so I want to show here one figure. Um, this shows the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So this is the hypothetical value, how much global warming occurs at equilibrium when we double the CO2. And this shows, this figure shows here for different climate simulations from the past up to CMX6, and this in orange, yeah? I'm focusing on the paper, where is this paper for me, or there are a lot of other aspects. I don't care about this for this talk. So I'm just looking at the climate sensitivity. So if you double the CO2, how much warmer does the global temperature get? And um, there's always been a range in the model between two and five. And if you look at the CMX6 model, um, and where our model with the meltpoint schemes are, also the HM3 and UKSM, they are here on the top. So we have a climb, we have a largest um, uh, um, climate sensitivity in this model. Um, in this, so this doesn't mean this is, this is caused by the meltpoints, obviously, um, because when you go from one model to another model, you change thousands of things. There's changes in the atmosphere, in the, in the ocean, and some parts in the sea ice. So it is very hard to say what is the reason for this. And, and this paper, or my understanding is uh, that is more discussed with actually the aerosol treatment is the main, the main reason for this. But I think it's interesting to see that we get actually this, this high sensitivity and potentially the meltpoints could have an impact on this as well. Um, okay, one figure, I want to show another figure. And this is a simulation for the last interglacial period. Um, and this last interglacial period was 127,000 years ago. If you look at this, um, the, the, the greenhouse gas concentrations, they are a tiny bit lower than, uh, much lower than nowadays. They are a tiny bit lower than at the pre-industrial climate. So CO2 value instead of, also now we have, I don't know, 400. Pre-industrial is 280 and at this period it was 260. But what is different is the, um, is the orbital parameters. So um, that means we get the short wave, we get more short wave radiation in, in the summer and actually also with the short wave, the season, the spring season starts earlier. And if we run the HM3 model with this um, with the meltpoint scheme, we get no sea ice for this period. So we get the summer sea free ice condition 127,000 years ago. And this was the HM3 model is the first climate model actually to do this. So other climate models have lower sea ice there than for pre-industrial definitely. And most of them also went for current conditions, but um, not as low as this. So the reason why we get it so low is, is in, in mainly the, the melt on that. Here, the melt on that in, in thus showing the day where the pond area is larger than 1%, and you see the last interglacial the period, and for the pre industrial, and here the difference. And you see that for the last interglacial, in average, it's about 10 days earlier when the melt season starts, in the central Arctic, even 20 days earlier. And so there is the, the um, pond form so early that we get a lot of short wave radiation, so we get a strong increase and much more melting. And the question is, how much has this to do? And it's a little obvious from this, from the study, that melt ponds play a big role in the summer free ice conditions in the last interglacial in the simulation. And whether we don't really know what the sea, the sea ice conditions were at this period, but there are some um, estimates about the temperature. And the air temperatures in the simulation without sea ice match better than, um, than the ones which have a higher um, sea ice. Um, Okay, but what we actually want to do, we want to identify the impact of a meltpoint scheme. And this is always, of course, if you have climate simulations, they have a lot of internal variability. So, and ideally you would think, oh, yeah, you want to do a historical run, or you want to do a future scenario run and see, or if you put meltpoints in, do we get sea uh, ice conditions different for the future? But to do this is very, is, is not, is very expensive because um, there is like, like we, have, we have weather and everyday changes in a climate model, there's interannual variability, even decadal variability, which has nothing to do with uh, setup. So to be able to distinguish, to make sure what is the difference, but what is the impact of one, one, one tiny change in the, in the model setup, um, we need constant forcing runs. And when we can do long runs, and then we can, we can, we can see what is actually the signal back. 
and um, this is the uh, um, from, from, from Rachel, she's also here, and her um, PhD, she, did, she performed three, no, nine different simulations and three different schemes. So first, the, the default scheme in HGM3 with the, with the explicit meltpoint model. Second, um, this is the, called the E-scheme, ex, explicit meltpoint scheme. Uh, we, for, here, the implicit meltpoint scheme is just we all have parameterization, no meltpoints, but we change, the surface, we change the albedo for um, bare ice um, if they have melting conditions. And then there is the, um, the end scheme. We do actually take the meltpoint scheme, but let all the melt water run off. So we have not, we don't account for the process at all. And we have done, uh, she has done this for three different periods. So for the um, for the pre-industrial run with 1815 um, forcing, for the last interglacial, with a, I described up, and for, we call it a near future run. This is a bit tricky. Um, we used here constant forcing data for two, sorry. We used constant forcing data for 2014. This doesn't sound like near future because this sounds more like present, but this is a hypothetical run. So if the conditions, would, the CO2 conditions, aerosol conditions would stay the same and we run this. This is what we would get in the simulation. In reality, this doesn't happen. And these values are not valuable for 2014 because there is an adjustment, of course. Um, while the sea ice reacts quite quickly to changes, but in the ocean and so on. So these simulations would, in principle, simulate the conditions we might have in 20, 30 years. But the, this is not really the point of this. The point is what are the differences between the models. Hmm? Okay. So let's have a look at the result. Um, here we see the September sea ice extent for the pre-industrial area. So we see if we don't have ponds, we have a high sea ice extent. Makes sense, we have an impact of ponds. But whether we use the explicit or implicit scheme, okay, the results are not identical. We have different results, but they, we cannot distinguish them because the internal variability uh, is there. So we have varies between six and eight, but it varies in both simulations. So we get, we could say we get, it doesn't really matter here whether we use the explicit or implicit scheme for the pre-industrial period. If you look at the last interglacial, we do, we do get difference between the implicit and explicit scheme. In the explicit scheme, we have 98 of 100 years, we have ice-free conditions. And whereas in the implicit scheme, we have a bit of a mixture and half, half of the years are ice-free. So we do get a big impact whether we use the scheme. Okay, what is happening for the future? We actually see a very large difference here. So between the green and the, and the orange line. So while if we use the implicit scheme, um, we do have here, there's a trend in this because this is the adjustment I did speak about. So this is the 100 times years. We did take off the first 15 years for the direct as measurement. We still see a trend here, but this green line is distinctly higher than this, this orange line. And which I think this is very interesting to see, right? We do have, we, we just changed one parameter in the model setup in a global climate model, and we do get more or less at one climate state the, 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 the same conditions, but in another climate scale, we don't. And there's, there's a reason for that with, with feedback processes, which, which um, from, the, from the pond scheme, we get a, we get a bit stronger albedo re, um, reduction than in the implicit scheme. And then we get a larger pond fraction, implicit scheme doesn't work so well for this. Or we get at least, but we'll be careful in the language, we get differences. We are here. What I want to say, we don't know whether this model is better than this because this is a period, this is a hypothetical, hypothetical, can't really pronounce this, uh, simulation. Um, so this, we cannot compare this with observations. Here's the observations are just shown for, as a reference, but we can say, okay, it does actually matter whether what we do with the meltpoints. Okay, I think I want to skip this slide and come to the conclusions. So 24 years after Shiba, we do have some results from a global climate model with a sophisticated meltpoint model. Um, from the latest uh, study I showed, we do not claim that this, uh, the results with a sophisticated meltpoint model are more realistic. There are actually some indications that the climate sensitivity seems to be quite high. So maybe the setup leads to too much melting, the feedback process is too strong. But um, what we do can show that meltpoints, I should stop writing on it, that um, melt 
on this button. Huh? But melt ponds do matter. They are important for um, for um, climate simulations, even if you are just interested on the Pan-Arctic, because what you do there has an impact on on the albedo feedback. Um, in five years ago, so we had a this we had a discussion about what was important for climate models, um, and was a bit initiated now from the literature as well. And I think from this paper and my contribution is in a way, all what is important for the, for the sea ice is determined by two important processes, some of the sea ice albedo and the negative winter process. And the balance between these two is important when you want to predict when the Arctic becomes ice cream in summer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, we don't have much time, but I think it's if anyone has a question or two in the audience. Is that you, Bruno? Yeah, okay. Wait, wait for the microphone. <laughs> the mosaic data seems to suggest that there's a memory from one summer to the following summer, like a depression one summer, like a, basically like the following summer, you might see melt pond in the same location. I was wondering. Can you do, do you see that also in the model and with the, the parameterization that you've developed? A, a memory of previous years, melt on location with the following summers? I haven't really looked like this from the following summer in the simulation, so I can't directly answer this. Um, I know from the preconditioning, it does matter how the eye thickness distribution is in winter. So what we have in, in January, February, how it is, is, and this could be affected also by the previous summer, but I haven't looked at this. And this does matter, of course, with the ice distribution, how much, how much thin ice and thick ice and how this is distributed it does determine how, how large the ponding uh, starts in the model in the spring. But the collection to the previous summer, it would be interesting to look at that, but I, I, have, I haven't looked at this yet. Thanks. Okay, David, of course, sort of said what I was going to say. So, um, well, the mic's nearby. I really enjoyed your talk. I have a quick question. So, you showed this figure that, that had Gen 3 is like has the highest equilibrium climate sensitivity. You kind of gave this little teaser mentioning that uh, it, it has this melt pond parameterization. Have you looked at in these runs with different melt pond parameterizations at, at or has anyone looked at, at how that influences the the climate sensitivity the effect of climate sensitivity and had in, in the model and had gem three and similarly uh how that how big an impact it has on on the surface albedo feedback it's like a global radiative feedback on on global warming i mean i probably let's wait what ed will actually talk about in his stuff and he might be able to comment with on this i'm not involved in the metal i think it would be interesting to actually check the climate sensitivity depending on the melt pond scheme i know the simulation hasn't been done yet yeah. Okay, Ed's going to talk to us in a minute, so um, we should probably move on then um, to our next speaker. So, Farika, can you come up?